Yan. Ut. you doing? Doing pretty good. Still here in the uh, motel room in uh, New Jersey. Uh, Brad's here with me, but Drago is uh, back in Tennessee. Now, you know, uh, for some time now, I've been running an old obscure TV theme song in the intro, but this is going to be the last time I do it. I'm just, I don't know, getting tired of it. <laughs> I'll come up with something else. Uh, but for now, guess the TV theme music correctly and you'll win a prize. Uh, tell them what they'll win, Brad. This ingenious device lets you give yourself and family perfect haircuts every time. If you missed the uh, TV theme music to the Noah anointing video, here it is. So I recently got my first uh, copyright strike since I, uh, since I started the channel back up. I had to go back to... Uh, copyright strike to school on the YouTube. Now, uh, as we talked about before, some of these preachers, they get upset when you uh, analyze what they say, uh, when you respond to it, when you criticize it. And so they'll invoke some kind of like a copyright right to their material. So they copyright a sermon. You know, they say it's my sermon. You, you can't uh, you can't do stuff with it. And so uh, they'll file a claim in YouTube, especially if it's a it's a big name pastor like uh, Stephen Furtick or uh, Joel Osteen or uh, Bethel Church, TD Jakes. Uh, they, they'll side with them because they have uh, they have the clout, you know. So uh, anyway, so I did this uh, threshing floor video with Ubert Angel and uh, Vody Bacham on uh, false teachers, and the clip uh, that I found from Ubert Angel. This was this was the whole thing. Somebody had uploaded and just called it uh, Ubert Angel on uh, false teachers, uh, wolves in sheep clothing. It was from his uh, his uh, channel, um, and so uh, I just I mean whatever was there was what I put next to what um, uh, Vody Bacham was saying. <clears throat> Now, Uber Angel filed a, a copyright claim, and the video was taken down, but before that, I was able to save it and uh, re-upload it, and I took his uh, his voice and his image and obscured him a little bit, so that, that should be past the uh, copyright uh, deal. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, Vody Balkum also, uh, he didn't he didn't file a copyright claim for some reason. Yeah, when when you when you watch uh, uh, the video, you'll see why. Because Vody just preaches the Bible. He's not a false teacher. He's he's not afraid to have his material out there for anybody to examine and criticize. He has nothing to hide, Vody Bakker. But Uber Angel has something to hide. Because all I did was take his teaching and put it next to Vody Bakker. So Uber Angel does not stand behind his own teaching. Bottom line. So anyway. Uh, I, I doctored it to where um, it should be past the copyright. And so I re uploaded it here. This is uh, Uber Angel um, and Bodie Balkum versus uh, Matthew uh, 7 15. Now, when you watch it now, bear in mind that Uber Angel had this video taken down. He, he didn't want his material, his sermon, put next to Bodie Balkum's for some reason. Uh, maybe you'll figure out why. So, anyway, this is the. Uh, this is the redo of the uh, Vody Bakum Uber Angel versus uh, Matthew 7 15 video. Uh, God bless. Y'all take care and I uh, hope you uh, learn something from this video. When you hear of this subject, wolves in sheep's clothing, they have made you think it's talking about pastors, preachers, prophets, teachers, apostles behind the pulpit. That's a lie, lie, liar, 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 pens on fire. As we rapidly move toward the culmination of the Sermon on the Mount, we've come, as we looked on last week, to this last section where we see these four comparisons or these four juxtapositions, if you will. We come to this moment where Jesus actually applies the Sermon on the Mount, where he, where he, he brings his message to a, a conclusion in a very pointed way. Basically
basically calling for a response from his hearers. And in the first of those four segments we saw on last week, he calls his hearers to recognize these two roads, that there are two entrances. There is the broad gate and the narrow gate. There are two paths. There is the easy path and the difficult path. There are two crowds, the many and the few, and there are two destinations. One leads to life, the other leads to destruction. In these middle two sections, they're actually uh, combined, if you will. So we're going to look at this week and then again on next week, the same group of individuals. What we've looked at, these two groups of individuals, those who go in through the narrow gate and those who go in through the broad gate, we've looked at those who basically, in one sense, hear the Sermon on the Mount, believe the Sermon on the Mount, apply the Sermon on the Mount, are converted by this message that they hear from Jesus and those on the other end who choose another route, whether that route is something as far away from Christ as imaginable or whether that route is something that is as close to the route that Christ prescribes as possible without actually coming to repentance and faith. And here we see that there's another obstacle along the way. And that obstacle along the way is false prophets. We'll see them in the next two paragraphs, the false prophets. Today we look at the false prophets and Jesus' illustration of the trees and the fruit, beginning at verse 15. If you'll join me there. Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20. And he says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruit. It's not it. It's not it. Look at the scriptures clearly. Verse number 15. Beware of false prophets. The word false prophets is the word pseudo prophetics. Okay. It does not mean prophet. It just means summer. Let me Let me just read it so that you understand what it says here. And so that people can understand. Pretend for teller. What's this? Oh, religious imposter. And uh, somebody who utters falsehoods under the name of divine prophecies. It doesn't mean a prophet. Uh, it doesn't mean behind the pulpit. Now, before we even begin, let me say that we are allergic to the kind of teaching that Jesus puts forth here in this passage. Our culture has rendered us allergic to this kind of teaching that Jesus puts forth in this passage. We'll talk more about our allergy as we continue on here. But it makes us very uncomfortable when we talk about this issue because Jesus identifies the fact that there are, first and foremost, false prophets. There are false prophets. There are people who are out there who are false prophets. There are those who speak the truth, and there are those who tell lies. There are false prophets. Listen to D.A. Carson as he puts a finer point on it. Warnings against false prophets are necessary, or are necessarily based on the conviction that not all prophets are true. That truth can be violated, and that the gospel's enemies usually conceal their hostility and try to pass themselves off as fellow believers. Now, I want to prove to you that it doesn't mean behind the pulpit. What's this now? Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. Uh -huh. Preachers, apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists are not called sheep in the Bible. They're called shepherds. Oh. There are 
these false prophets. This is not new, by the way. Listen to this. Just a few passages of Scripture. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 11. We read, For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 24. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Matthew 24, 11. Many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. What I read to you the first time was Matthew 24, 24. Mark 13, 22 is a retelling of this teaching of Christ. And then Luke chapter 6 and verse 26 reads this way. Woe to you when all people speak well of you. For so their fathers did to the false prophets. Acts chapter 13 and verse 6. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. And in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1, we read... But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. So again, this is not an isolated incident here in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus bring this, brings this up a number of times in his ministry, and we also have this in the Acts of the Apostles and in the Epistles. The idea that there are false prophets. We have to be aware of this fact. There are false prophets. But the Bible should say, beware of what? Of false prophets who come to you hey, in shepherd's clothing. He says in sheep, in congregation's clothing. They are in the congregation. They are not behind the pulpit. The second thing we need to know is this. False prophets are not always easy to spot. Notice what Jesus says here. Look with me, if you will, again in verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. In other words, Jesus says, the first word he uses is that beware, be alert, look carefully. Because there are false prophets, and these false prophets will clothe themselves outwardly in the clothing of the sheep. But inwardly, they are not so. Usually we think it's easy. And by the way, that's not what we're allergic to in our culture. We're not allergic to the false prophet who's an obvious false prophet. That's not what we're allergic We don't mind that at all. When someone stands up and tells just blatant, ball face lies, we, we have very little problem saying, well, that's a false prophet. Or if false prophets are doing horrendous things and hurting people and manipulating people, you know, the Jim Joneses of the world, we have no problem saying that's a false prophet. But Jesus puts a finer point on it here. Jesus says, beware of false prophets, not because they're going to be easy to spot, they're going to be out there for you to see and for all the world to see, and you'll be able to know, hey, that's a false prophet. Ding, 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 red flag. No. Jesus says, you need to beware, you need to be on the lookout, because these individuals will dress themselves in the uniform of my sheep. There are people inside it and wolves moving pets. It's not prophets, it's not pastors, it's not teachers, it's not evangelists, no way, it's not apostles, it's not behind the pulpit, it's congregants, chosen congregants in the church that pretend to tell others, God said to me, God said to me, false prophet does not mean a pulpit. They will hide who they truly are. They will learn to use narrow gate language. They will learn to emulate hard road living. They will learn to masquerade as small crowd people. And they will learn to trick you into thinking that they are on the road that leads to life. And yet, they are false 
prophets. Here's why it's difficult for us to identify false prophets. Number one, because of biblical and theological illiteracy. You've been lied to, and the devil is smiling, because the devil understands one principle. Yet the shepherd and the ship was cut up. That's his principle. That makes it difficult to identify false prophets. If we don't know the Bible, if we don't know doctrine, if we don't know theology, it is virtually impossible for us to identify false prophets. That's also, by the way, why we're allergic to those who identify false prophets. We're allergic to it. We really are. We don't like it. It makes us uncomfortable. Somebody's identifying an individual as a false prophet, and we just kind of go, well, no, that person's not a false prophet, because they actually stand up and they use Bible verses. And of course, if it was a false prophet, they would stand up and use, what, the the Bhagavad Gita, do you think? It's in the Word. So he knows every word that is spoken in the Bible. He can twist it so that he can hit the shepherd and the ship will resign. You think that would be a successful false prophet if he stood up and didn't use Bible verses? No. Of course they use Bible verses. Of course they use narrow gate language. Of course they do. And what they do is prey on individuals who are biblically and theologically illiterate. Here it is in verse number 10 of Matthew 24. And then shall men be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. I want you to understand what it says. What is it talking about? It's talking about many. Say many. Many. It's many shall be offended. Watch this now. Watch this. And many shall be offended. They're offended. And shall betray one another. The word offended there, if you didn't understand it, it is the word scandalizo, where we get the word scandal and scandalous. Secondly, it's difficult because of the prevalence of ecumenism and syncretism. As a friend of mine calls it, Rodney King theology. Can't we all just get along? The answer is a resounding no. So, so men shall be in a scandalous thing, you know. Uh, but, but watch this, watch this. The word scandalizo is, is, a, is a trip, you know, the trip you put for reds. Where it is standing like this and the red comes in to try and eat. Maybe a peanut or peanut butter you put on something and it crushes. Trips the red. But that's not the scandalizo. The thing that was... The bait is the scandalism. So he says, and men shall be scandalism, shall hold the bait. But the problem with the scandalism is this when the red is trimmed, the scandalism is trimmed. We cannot. What do light and darkness have to do with one another? Can't we all just get along? You know the problem with can't we all just get along? Is that it flies in the face of what Jesus just said here. Beware of false prophets. Yeah, I know Jesus, but can't we just all get along? No, I'm trying to tell you they have sheep's clothing on on the outside, but on the inside they're ravenous wolves. Yeah, Jesus, I know, but really, wouldn't it be more like you to just get along with them regardless of the fact that they are lying on you doctrinally and theologically? No, what he said was, beware, not go along and get along. He said, beware, but we're allergic to that. Why? Because of this false and dangerous notion that somehow drawing a line in the sand and saying this is true and that is not is somehow unchristian. Because remember the new John 3.16. Remember the old John 3.16 is actually John 3.16. The new John 3.16 is Matthew 7.1. used to be that everybody knew the old John 3.16. You put John 3.16 up and everybody goes, yeah, I know what that is. You know? Now you put John 3.16 up and people go, what is, what is, what is, what, what is that? Of course, they don't know the verse, Matthew 7.1. They don't know, you know, if you put that number up, they would have no idea. But if you just started it, judge not, lest you, they could finish it, lest you be judged. Never seen a Bible a day in their life. But if you start Matthew 7.1, trust me, they will finish it. 
God. They didn't get it. They didn't get it. They didn't get it. In other words, when you are offended, you are trapped yourself, and the person you offend, who offended you, is also trapped. Yeah. You didn't get that. You didn't get that. I'm, I'm about to show you something. I'm about to show you something. Here's what's interesting. Matthew seven one. If you just use a little logic here, comes just before what we're reading now. You, 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 you figure that out? We're in Matthew 7, 15, which means Matthew 7, 1 just came a very short 14 verses earlier. And those who would manipulate Matthew 7, 1 would have you believe this, that basically Jesus said in Matthew 7, 1 that you should not judge under any circumstances. Therefore, when we read Matthew 7, 15, we have to understand it in the context of not ever judging. Beware. But don't judge. Y- yes, Vody. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if, if I was going to um, beware and, you know, watch really closely and discern if somebody was true or false. I was just thinking, you know, maybe that would kind of by definition be judging. Give that man a prize. So, so we are talking about many, right? So be what? Offended mm-hmm. and shall betray one another and shall hurt one another. How, how, how many people? Many. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I don't know if you are getting this now. Then, then verse number 11 says, and many. Mm-hmm. Oh, did he get it? False prophets shall arise and deceive. Who, who? Which one? The offended. Here's the other thing. Turn with me, if you will, to Titus. I quote this all the time, but I want you to go and see it and touch it and feel it and taste it and everything else. All right. Titus chapter one. Just turn there and look at that for a moment, if you will. Because I, I get I get letters from time to time and emails from time to time with people who are upset with me um, because I identify false prophets from time to time and and usually basically all I do is send them back this Titus chapter one verse nine by the way Titus chapter one beginning at verse five we have the requirements for elders the biblical requirements for elders at the end of those requirements verse nine he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. That's my job description, folks. To know sound doctrine, to teach sound doctrine, and to rebuke those who contradict sound doctrine. That's my job. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. And any pastor who is not rebuking unsound doctrine is not doing his job. Does that mean we have to be mean and nasty to people? Sometimes. (laughs) Usually not. So if you are preaching to the offended, you are a false prophet. If all your congregations are people disappointed by pastors, you are the false prophet. You didn't hear that. You didn't hear that now. Back in our passage. Back in our past. And by the way, that's why it's difficult for us. Again, it's difficult for us because false prophets are difficult to identify. They're there, but they're difficult to identify. We're not just talking about the obvious ones who are out there. Jesus says, these are individuals who have clothed themselves in the garments of my sheep, my followers. See, the false prophet that's the scary one is not the one who is out there teaching doctrine that is completely in opposition to biblical truth. No, the false prophet who's the scary one is the one who has the meat of a lie covered with the skin of the truth. And many false prophets shall arise. And then many shall be offended. Then we go to verse number 12. And because iniquity shall abound, where? Among the offended. The love of who? Of the Christians? No, the many we are talking about. 
Listen to this. John chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. Because the third thing we need to know is false prophets are not a danger to the true church. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he, get, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of a stranger. Amen. Do we need to be on guard? Yes. But here's what you need to know. True sheep follow the true shepherd, and they do not follow the voice of a stranger. Yet, false prophets are still a danger. Why? Listen to what Jesus says. First of all, the admonition, beware. Beware. Why be on guard? I mean, if there's no danger, why be on guard? Secondly, what does he call these individuals? Ravenous wolves. In other words, they come to do much harm, like the thief who comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. Here's what you need to know. A false prophet is ultimately not going to take a narrow gate, hard road, small crowd, on the way to life, Christian, and turn them into a broad gate, easy road, big crowd, on the way to death, non-Christian. We talked about that last week. We talked about the perseverance of God's elect last week. So that's not the danger. But here's what you need to know. A believer can have his or her life turned upside down by a false prophet. They're offended. You didn't get this, you didn't get this. And many show their love. Watch this. Their love shall wax cold. There's no love for nobody. There's, no, there's nobody they love. They're not talking to somebody. They're not talking to anybody who they love. <laughs> Psychotic people. <laughs> then he says, but wait, 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 wait a minute. We're not talking about Christian so so verse number. They didn't say, but he that shall endure. Uh, the ones that are not offended. Yeah. Uh, but that shall be among these people uh, that shall see these things happen. These ones shall be saved. But the ones who are offended are the ones we are sending false prophets in sheep's clothing. Who shall deceive many? Which many? The offended ones. So false prophets are not coming to the church. They're coming to the people who are Christians but offended by whosoever. Good News World with Hubert Angel. Provoking a reaction and always worth hearing. A believer who knows God, loves God, and is following God can have his or her life turned upside down by a slick-talking false prophet. Sometimes for years, a false prophet can have a true follower of Christ twisted and tied all up in knots until they are ultimately delivered from the falsehood. So don't you think for a moment that just because you're a follower of Christ, just because you've been born again, that you don't need to be careful about what you listen to and that there is no danger of listening to false prophets. There is a danger. And they can do you and your family much, much harm. That's one of the reasons that God has given elders to the church to protect the doctrine of the church, to protect the teaching of the church, to refute false teaching that would come in and impose itself on the church. That's one of the reasons that God gave the office of elder, to protect the body, especially in those circumstances. Because there are people out there who look good, who sound good. They're on Christian radio, they're on Christian television. Some of them have household names and are best-selling Christian authors. And they're ravenous wolves. What do they do? False prophets bear bad fruit. And they bear bad fruit in two main ways. Bad teaching and bad living. Bad teaching, bad living. Look at what Jesus says again. You will recognize them by their fruits. Outwardly, they may look really good, but you need to become a pretty good fruit inspector. 
you will know them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but diseased trees bear bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. It can't happen that way. What do you do? Examine the fruit. That's our responsibility as believers. Examine the fruit. Here's what I want you to see. The first fruit is bad teaching. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, I just had to read this for you. Listen to this. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, 20 through 22. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how may we know the word that the Lord has not spoken? By the way, as New Testament believers, we have an advantage over those to whom Moses was speaking. The advantage that we have is we have God's word. So God, who in times past spoke to the prophets and the fathers in many portions and in many ways, in these last days, has spoken to us in his son through whom he made the world. So understand this. So we're reading here in Deuteronomy individuals who did not have a completed canon. We, however, do have a completed canon. So we have a different set of criteria. So as I read this, and I'll explain that more in a moment, but listen to this. How, how do we know? How are you going to know that this person hasn't spoken from me? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken presumptuously. You need not fear him does what he say come to pass that's the test Moses gives the people of Israel Moses says if you're wondering whether someone is a false prophet or not it's very easy you just ask yourself this question did what they said was going to come to pass actually come to pass? But remember, I just told you, according to Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, that's no longer our test. Our test is, does what he said come from and line up with the Bible? Amen. See, our Bibles are bound in leather, not three-ring binders, folks. And that's for a reason. We are not in the process of getting continued revelation from God. So the first sign of a false prophet is, he speaks things as though they are from God, but they're not found in God's Word. He speaks things as though they are from God, but they are not found in God's Word. We've talked about this before, but I have to take a moment to do it again. I beseech you, I've begged you before from this very spot, but I'm going to beg you again from this very spot to be very careful and to stop using language like, God said, God told me, and God spoke to me. Don't talk like that. That's heretical language, people. Because when you use words like said, spoke, and told, you are referring to audible speech, and you are equating whatever comes after that with what we have in the Word of God. And that's heresy. Now, what we usually mean is, God enlightened me, God brought something to my understanding, God impressed upon me. You, use those words all you want, but do not say, God said, God told me, or God spoke to me, because if you do, you are out of line theologically. That is unbiblical speech, because God does not say, God does not speak, God does not tell in those terms anymore. Not because I say so, but because the Bible says so. We have a closed canon. So one of the ways that you know that someone is potentially a ravenous wolf, again, there are individuals who just speak these kind of things and they don't mean it. It just sort of comes out because we're so used to hearing it in our culture. And we'll say things like, God told me this, God said that, God spoke this, and we'll say it, and that's not what we mean. That's not what I'm talking about. That's somebody who just needs to be corrected. And you and I both, all of us in this room, are more than likely guilty of having been 
loose with our speech in that way before. We did not mean, I am speaking to you with the same authority as Moses or Paul or Jesus. That's not what we meant. We were just loose with our speech. We adopted a bad habit from our culture, and that's not what we meant. But there are individuals in our culture who say those things and mean them. They're false prophets. They're false prophets. According to Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, they are false prophets. That just sounds so judgmental. Welcome to the narrow gate. Not only do we have false teaching like that, but we also have false teaching just like the stuff that we found, for example, there in Deuteronomy. People making predictions that just don't come to pass. For example, probably the most famous, Edgar Wiesenut. Anybody know that name, Edgar Wiesenut? If you know that name, you probably know that name because of one of the most notorious Christian books ever published. 88 Reasons That the Rapture Will Come in 1988. Anybody familiar with that title? It was a bestseller. Sold over a million copies. 88 Reasons the Rapture Will Come in 1988. How many of you know he wasn't thrown out on his ear in 1989, but yet still had a ministry and still published? False prophet. Ellen G. White predicted that the world was going to end in, 19, in excuse me, 1843, 1844, and 1851. Here's what's amazing. By 1851, people were still listening. And who can forget the first Gulf War when TBN was filled with false prophets basically saying, folks, this is the Battle of Armageddon. Babylon has arisen again. In fact, they would tell things like, you know, Saddam Hussein thinks of himself as the re-coming of Nebuchadnezzar. This is it! How about all the Y2K crazies? This is it. Go get all your stuff and get ready. It's over. The clock's going to strike midnight. 1999, and that next second will be the end of the world as you know it. Get your stuff and get ready. False prophets, everyone, everyone, okay? Not only is there the bad teaching, but there's also the bad living. Look with me, if you will. And this is an ex- well, it's not that extensive a passage, but look with me in Second Timothy chapter three. We can't talk about this and not read Second Timothy chapter three. It would be criminal not to read Second Timothy chapter three. Look with me, if you will. Second Timothy chapter three. Really, almost the whole chapter. Not almost the whole chapter. We do. We have to read the whole chapter. We just have to. Okay? Second Timothy chapter 3. But understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. Now, here's what you need to know. Okay? From a theological, hermeneutical perspective. When he uses this term, just like when the author of Hebrews uses the term in Hebrews chapter 1. When he uses this term in the last days, what he's referring to is the time between the first coming or advent of Jesus Christ and the consummation of all things. So when he says in the last days, he doesn't mean, you know, when it's really close to the time of the rapture. That's not what he's saying. This term, when we read it in the New Testament, when we read it from the author author of Hebrews, and we read it from Paul and others in the New Testament, um, again, he's not like he's talking about the last day, different term altogether. When he says in the last days here, he's referring to that intermittent period between the first coming of Christ and the consummation of all things when he comes again. But know this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without 
without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. Stay away from such people. Well, that sounds so judgmental. Welcome to the narrow gate. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also oppose the truth. Men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. Wow! They're disqualified regarding the faith. That's more judgmental. But they will not go very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and suffering that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from all of them the Lord rescued me. Here's what's interesting. You remember last week? We talked about that term that comes after the narrow gate, that term for the way. It says the way is hard. Remember I told you last week that the word used there in the Greek is the word from which we get the word persecution. So in essence, Jesus was saying one of the evidences that you are a narrow gate, hard road Christian is persecutions. Here, Paul is saying to Timothy, you know those liars? Those liars are not like me. And one of the ways that they're not like me, Paul says what? You know my persecutions. You've seen evidence of my narrow gate, hard road, few friends life. And that's one of the distinctions, Paul says, between himself and the false prophets. Listen to the other. Thank you so much. Listen to the rest of this. Indeed, verse 12, all who desire to live godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Not might, not could, but will. While evil people and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you've learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, rebuke, and correction, for training in righteousness that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. What does Paul tell Timothy? You're okay because you've got the scriptures. Two distinctions between the true prophet and the false prophet. Number one, their teaching. Number two, their life. Look at the fruit. Look at the fruit of what they teach. Look at the fruit of how they live. Does what they teach line up with what the scriptures say? Does how they live line up with what the scriptures say? By the way, and if we're looking for the way that they live, where would we look? Again, think about the sermon that Jesus is preaching. Don't disconnect it. Where do we go to find the kind of lifestyle that Jesus is talking about? How about all the way back to chapter 5 and verse 1, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount? He lays out for us what the kingdom lifestyle is like. That's what we're looking for. Go back to the Beatitudes. Go back to the six antitheses. Go back to chapter 6. True prayer. True fasting. True giving. Go back and look at the true religion of Christianity as Jesus has already laid it out in chapter 5, chapter 6, and the beginning of chapter 7. And you have the kind of fruit for which we are called to look. Finally, none of this matters if we're not ready and willing to test and judge. None of this matters if we're not ready and willing to test and to judge. 
It's meaningless if we're unwilling to test and to judge. By the way, why do I say judge? The, the, the last phrase that Jesus uses is very important. This week and next week. The last phrase he uses in this paragraph is, the tree that doesn't bear good fruit, it's going to be cut down and thrown into the fire. That's what you call judgment. Next week we'll hear, depart from me. I never knew you, you worker of iniquity. You practicer of lawlessness. See, and none of this matters. It, it basically, we don't believe that we're supposed to test. We don't believe that we're supposed to make judgments. Again, I'm not talking about being judgmental. Go back to the messages on the early part of chapter 7, all right? We're not talking about turning your nose up at individuals who don't like the things that you like, who don't agree with you on non-essentials. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about false prophets and identifying false prophets who are destructive in the life of the church. And if all we believe that we're supposed to do is read this for reading's sake and not apply it and not exercise sound judgment and not distance ourselves from false teaching and not expose false teaching whenever we find it, then we'll have a problem. Listen to this, if you will. 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you will know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and is now in the world already. Again, is this the only test? No, it's not the only test. Remember the series we did through 1 John? There are many tests. But here, dealing with false prophets, he says, test what you hear from them. Test the spirits by the spirits. This is judgment, folks. And it's the way Christians are commanded to live. Look with me, if you will, at Acts chapter 17. Verses 10 and 11. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. How about that? These Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. What, pray tell, made them more noble than the Jews in Thessalonica? Glad you asked. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Folks, this is the Apostle Paul. Did you follow this? This is the Apostle Paul. This guy comes into town, and he's been bitten by serpents and lived. This guy has a man listening to him one night, falls out of a window and dies. Raise him back to life. He comes to Berea, and they say, all that's fine and good, but here's what we're going to do. We're going to take what you said today, and we're going to go back and look in our Bibles. We're going to search the Scriptures to see if what you're saying is actually true. And the Bible says that made them more noble. Do you test what you hear? Even from here? From this place? We're far from infallible, folks. We are. Do you test what you hear? That's one of the reasons that we teach the way we do. That's one of the reasons that we come and bring your Bible, open your Bible, look in your Bible, read it, touch it, taste it, see it. Because we want you to develop the habit of testing what you hear. Don't you dare trust me. You trust the Word. I am a frail, fragile, wounded, broken, 
messed up individual. By the way, welcome to the club. Because that's what every one of us is. And as such, we've got to have something more than just the power of our own persuasion and personalities. We have to test everything by the Word. Test everything by God's truth. Test everything by what's been spoken. Here's what's sad. I've actually had this seen with my own eyes in churches. Disagreements about certain things or disagreements about, you know, what, what's going on here, what's going on there. I've seen it with my own eyes. Heard it with my own ears. Yeah, you keep opening that Bible. You keep reading those verses. I really don't care what those verses say. I've heard that from people who've been in church for years, for years. we got to be like the Bereans. We must test everything according to the scriptures. And we must be ready and willing always to identify, expose, and flee from false prophets. Don't like the way that sounds? Turn with me to one more passage. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. And look beginning in verse 6 of Ephesians chapter 5. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Our culture says, that's mean and nasty, that's judgmental, that's not Christian. The Bible says, test the Spirit, beware of false prophets, expose the deeds of darkness, refute those who contradict sound teaching. And now I will expose myself as a liar because there's one more passage of Scripture. And I said that was the last one. But I already told you that I'm a weak and frail and fragile individual. Jude. Jude gives us this. He says, while I was making every effort to write you concerning our common salvation, I felt the need to write you and urge you to contend earnestly for the faith, to epiagonizomai, to agonize greatly, to wrestle. The term is used in classical Greek for wrestlers who are engaged in combat. He says, I want you to engage in combat, to agonize greatly for the faith that was once for all handed down to the saints. Why? Because certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly persons who do two things. One, turn the grace of God into lawlessness. That's bad living. And number two, deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. That's bad teaching. Jude says, agonize greatly against false teachers. War with them. Those who turn grace into lawlessness and those who deny the essential truths of the gospel. Agonize greatly in that field of combat. Wage war in that field of combat. Refute those who contradict. Expose their dark deeds. And hold firmly to that which is true. Why? Because we delight in the combat? No. Because we delight in the truth. And there is a major difference between those two. Let us delight in the truth and beware of false prophets. 
And when you find them, show them much love, but no quarter. 